Hi everyone and welcome to Sci Dance Podcast Season 3. I'm your host Jasmine Cook. This is a dance science podcast presenting discussions with global industry leaders, aiming to make research and information more accessible and enhance dancer wellbeing, health and training at all levels of the sector. New episodes every Monday 6am London time. Hi everyone and welcome back to Sci Dance. I'm really excited to be here today with Rob from California. So Rob is originally from Taiwan and received his undergraduate degrees and his doctorate in physical therapy from Chapman University. Rob's entrance into dance began with breaking and hip hop culture and eventually led to studying classical modern dance techniques. Rob danced professionally in the LA commercial industry for eight years prior to pursuing physical therapy. Rob's passionate about creating environments and learning opportunities for dancers to support and explore their physical capabilities. Based in Orange County in California, Rob and his company, Dance Prehab, who you might have seen on Instagram, seek to reimagine the training and healthcare support for young dancers. Dance Prehab supports the local dance community via physical therapy, strength and conditioning, and injury risk reduction education. In addition to this, Rob is also the resident physical therapist at the University of California Irvine's Dance Department and has presented research and clear talk movement sessions at conferences for the International Association of Dance Medicine and Science and the Performing Arts Medicine Association. Welcome, Rob. It's so great to have you here today. Yes, thank you for having me, Jazzy. And thank you for the resource that you have created. And this is season three, right? So, yeah. Um, Amazing. Sure. So we'll get into it then. So tell us a little bit more about your experience of dance. So in the kind of American dance studio world, jazz, tap, contemporary ballet, a bit of a comparison of your experience of dance kind of growing up to what you're kind of working now. So um, hi, everybody. My name is Rob. I am from California, uh, grew up in Taiwan. So if there are any Taiwanese friends listening to this, Taiwan um, Dajiao. yes. Okay. Um, so I currently work within the what is known as like the the American sort of uh, competition dance environment and more specifically I work within um, the community where there's a lot of kids who get like strictly ballet training and then they also venture into contemporary and sort of vice versa so um, this experience is a little different from what I grew up with I grew up overseas and the way I came into dance was well before dance I was a baseball player for like 10 years so and I used to catch so I maybe have that to thank for like flexibility in some ways but um I I w learned dance mostly through a cultural lens um it wasn't like jazz ballet tap the way that most kids grew up here in America but um it was more so, you know, let's study this form of dance from this culture and like, what do these movements mean? And what is the, what, is, what are these social and cultural sort of like underpinnings of this movement? How does movement come around? And I think um, the way that my teacher in high school structured that was so, you know, we could understand where things came from. And I think as a young dancer, you know, uh, this is mid to late 90s and so like uh, break in b-boy and hip-hop culture was really expanding through the world at that point and you know you you learn about these things and you're you're excited about the, the dynamic movements but at some point you know you sit down in your question like well what is my relationship to this movement knowing that this movement comes from uh disenfranchised uh, colored youth in the Bronx in the New York in New York from like 1973. What is my relationship with that? So I think um, from a very young age from the get go, it was already set up for for me to sort of like look at movement, but also be aware of of where the, like the social and cultural factors came in, sometimes economical. And I think that has played a really big role in kind of even how I view um, dance training now and the environments that dance training occurs in, but also uh, in the physical therapy world too, in the rehab and healthcare world. Um, so, so I think being able to venture into the American sort of like dance scene after growing up in Taiwan just kind of gave a much broader perspective, I think. And I think one of the things that sort of helped keep me afloat um, mentally, emotionally while working in LA. And it's like, it's a lot of pressure too, because you never know 
when you can get a job, you never know when you could have a job and then suddenly not have a job. Uh, but I think there was a part of me that always felt like breaking and hip hop was sort of like the root of what my movement exploration was. And that's where I kind of put a lot of stock um, in my own sort of like self-development and movement journey. So, um, and we were battling, we were um, more involved in the underground scene, um, even though I was doing stuff in LA, but it was like that, that underground scene that I really felt connected to for myself. So I didn't put too much emphasis and self-worth and like whether or not I, you know, got a job or not, or um, how do I say this? I, I didn't put too much self-worth in whether or not I got a job or if I was able to, um, you know, make money. I always had this part of me that was like, this is what my true self is. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's so interesting because it's so like far from any of my experiences. It's so different. So it's really, really great to hear about it. And um, so could you tell us a little bit more about what the, so I actually did an episode kind of recently with Kendall, who talked a little bit about what the competition dance scene is like in America. Mm -hmm. But most of my audience is either like UK or elsewhere. And then, oh, I suppose the American, yeah, it's kind of growing a bit, but a little bit about what the competition dance scene looks like over there and why it's such a big deal. Um, It looks a little different for everybody but for the most if i were to make a general comment about it it's um in the current way that our frameworks are set up for a lot of our youth dancers i mean these competitions are opportunities to get noticed right so it's it's and especially coming up coming back um or coming back after our covid pandemic situation it's all the competitions are suddenly lumped all together. And so I think last year at one point, last summer, it was weekend after weekend after weekend after weekend. Um, and, you know, you're ramping up all of a sudden. So, and it's not that it's a, I, I try to hesitate from saying it's like a good or a bad thing. It's just kind of what it is um, it, it, in terms of what dance training and what the youth dance experience is now here in America. So you're you're a lot of kids will have you know not just solos but uh small group pieces larger group pieces let's go to these competitions um and they're never just local either so um ygp is really big and so there are some dancers that will go to multiple ones in different cities so it's a uh, it's a lot it's a lot for these kids and i think and we'll get into this a little bit more, especially talking about like the strength training side of things is how do you balance all of that with this, um, with all the things that they're doing. Um, since I started, or from when I used to dance until now, my world was still very separate, where this sort of, um, my friends that did competition and concert were sort of, um, there was more of like a delineation between the two, but I think now uh, there's so much more crossover just because of the opportunities that there are. So um, I think it's hard to define people that are just, oh, I'm just a concert. I just work in the concert world or I just work in the commercial world. There's, um, it's one and the same now in, from the way I'm seeing it and from the way that um, a lot of young dancers are training now. Yeah, definitely. And I imagine that it's pretty intense then on them from quite a young age and kind of pushes towards that sort of early specialization. So could you tell us a little bit more about, so you working as a physical therapist, when we spoke last time, you said you found a lot of value in helping dancers improve themselves with strength training. Can you tell us a bit about this? Yes. So um, I, so my own foray into sort of like really diving to strength and conditioning really started with my first job out of college uh, out of PT school so of course uh, depending on where you go here in America there's like some programs that will focus on the strength and conditioning and some programs that really don't so uh, my program really didn't so a lot of the strength and conditioning like programming periodization like those types of information I've kind of dug out on my own but my first job out of school was working for a um, amusement park that for professional reasons has to remain unnamed, but let's just say there are many people dancing in 
um, heavy suits and headgear. And so I think, you know, and you're talking anywhere between probably, you know, 28 to like 32 pounds of extra stuff that's on you and you're having to move. What was nice in that context was that we were given the leeway to help as much as we felt like was needed. And so you got to the point where um, people were essentially coming into our clinic and, and I guess for lack of a better term, working out you know, or, or, or you're, you're putting the, the types of stress that they need on their body in order to perform these movements with all this extra load. And so I think from there, I started really diving in into, you know, well, what does that mean to specifically set someone up for um, that? Because so, I mean, you would have people that were, you were, you know, dancing in these and dancing and performing with this, you know, crazy external load on top. But then you also had the people that were saying, you know, doing, um, six, seven shows a day of a, of a smaller sort of, uh, of a, of a smaller performance. And so what are those demands and how do those demands differ? And so that's where I started diving into, um, looking at that. Um, I didn't get into the, I, I sort of fell into the youth, um, dance world a little bit. My wife directs a pre-professional company out here in California. And so naturally, these kids would ask and then all of a sudden you're like, okay, well, like, I think you're doing pretty good in reference to what you came to see me for, but how do we continue to build on top of that? And, and how do you, for myself, it was kind of asking, you know, what is, and we'll talk about this a little bit more too, is, you know, what is the experience for them, you know, transitioning from, from rehab and, and physical therapy, physiotherapy into so like really building that capacity back up so they can get back to the things they need to do. Um, and I think a lot of people have probably mentioned the same thing where there is sort of that gap that still continues to exist. Um, and once again, bringing in like the social, cultural, uh, situational contexts, um, sometimes they like may or may not know how to navigate that. So um, I think there's the value in helping dancers improve strength training is not just the act of strength training itself, but understanding how strength training can truly exist alongside what their movement and what their dance uh, training practice is. Yeah, definitely. So I really want to focus today on the young dancers that you work with most at the moment. Uh, I guess almost selfishly, it's an area I'm kind of interested in, but I think it's pretty relevant to a lot of my audience as well, I hope. Um, but what was the, like, so speaking about those dancers then, what was their response or their approach to strength and conditioning when you started? So were they pretty open to it? They kind of wanted to know, they were intrigued or, yeah, what were their sort of thoughts? Did they have any preconceptions that weren't true? Anything like that? Really? Um, yeah. Yeah, they, they, were very, they were actually very open to it. I think that, um, in the context of my community and my immediate sort of population, I came into a time, I came into this at a time where, you know, with COVID and with the pandemic, everybody was sort of, um, you know, dancing less, um, people were asking more questions about health and wellness. And so I think that over the course of the year prior had already sort of set up and primed their minds to be more open to these things. Um, once again, I think in this community, things happen so fast. You have a lot of, you know, information comes through social media and then it goes out, like, what's the next thing too? So um, there in my head and the way I see it is there is the, they are accepting of it, but then like the immediate novelty of it does wear off, you know, after a while, it's like, okay, cool. I'm just doing another thing multiple times here. Um but I think overall, it has been welcomed because not necessarily because it's like a different, well, one, because it's a different activity, but ultimately, too, it's like a method where these kids are able to learn something different about themselves and um, their capacity and their, their capabilities. Um, and I think that's where, you know, looking at the situation, you look at it, you could say, okay, you know, yes, we have our, our boring exercises, you know, 
but then how you translate that over to something that's either a little bit more relatable, both in the context of them as dancers, but also in the context of them as, as humans and ultimately kids, you know? And um, I think, I think that it, it's been interesting to kind of see them respond to these different types of movements that they typically might not get or might not think about. So for example, like um, med ball slams. I mean, at what point, and I work, I work more specifically with a, with a ballet centric uh, population. And so they, when else do you get the chance to really kind of slam something against the wall with no consequence, you know what I mean? And, um, or even things like talking about jumps in a different way where um, there are different ways to jump for muscular power versus muscular endurance versus um, tendon health and, and quick rebound elasticity. And they, they kind of gravitate towards like, oh, I never, I never thought about that. Or like, um, or that training that the, in this way or understanding that I can move in this way help contributes to um, my, my performance uh, or my preparation, right? And so it, they have been receptive, which is I'm very fortunate for, yeah. Yeah, definitely. There's kind of two things there that I love. Firstly, that the idea that COVID opened their minds, I think that's such a great way to think about it because often we focus on the negatives and I know there have been so many and I know I'm coming, yeah, from a place of privilege that I can say that there are positives like that that come out of it. But I think the fact that, yeah, yes. it's there, open their minds it's just amazing and yeah there are positives to come out of it and then the other thing is it's really important that they do learn something about themselves because I think kids love that especially kids who are really invested in dance I think that's a really like um under maybe like what's that word that under not and un, not underappreciated but often forgotten about aspect of mm -hmm. SNC and these other ways of training is that they can really learn something about themselves and kids who love dance will probably love that and know that they can use it to help them. So I think mm -hmm. that yeah, engaging like that is really, really great. So how did dance prehab yeah. start then in its kind of current form? Um, so dance prehab started as an idea that I had that during school, uh, I would say during a lengthy class that I was, not that I wasn't paying attention, but <laughs> the ideas were flowing and um, things like that. And I was um, very fortunate that my, for whatever reason, the the cohort that I graduated with, a lot of us have um, sort of this, I guess you would call like the entrepreneurial sort of intention. And so we were always tossing ideas back and forth about how to start things. And so um, that's how the, the first iteration of it was. I just started an Instagram account and was like, I'm just gonna put information out there. And this was in maybe like mid 2017. So it was starting to grow then, but it's not as big as it was now. I was like, like, I look at it now, I'm like, this is wild. Like how much information is out there in a good way. Um, so I was working a full-time job, but then also this at, for a really long time was just a passion project. Um, and I just had, a, a couple hours a week at a very small uh, Pilates studio and and that's just how I started you know um, now over the course of the last two years it's gone from like Pilates studio to uh, when everything hit it was like you know my garage or like out in the park and and then I've been able to there have been people that have welcomed me into their spaces and so I was able to build from there but ultimately once again going back to what we were talking about with 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 introducing these these training methods or these concepts to dancers it really just came to a point of oh they are um doing well from what they came to see me for and you know how do we continue to do this and so there was, and, and me just operating by myself, it was very easy to say like, well, you know, if it works out for you schedule wise and, and it, it works for, you know, finances and your family, then let's, let's continue doing what we're doing. And from there, you know, they may have noticed something before that was like, oh, this is in my ankle. But all of a sudden it was like, oh, but like my hip feels this way or this way or this um, subjectively speaking. Um, you know, when I was starting, a lot of it was just kind of, 
I wasn't collecting as much information as I was now because I didn't have my processes or frameworks together at that point. But you knew that subjectively these dancers were feeling certain improvements that they may not have felt before. So it just kind of, uh, you know, I think with what things are now, it just was an extension of like, let's continue exploring this. And we're still exploring three years later. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, yeah. I was just going to say, so could you tell us a little bit more about, and um, so we spoke a little bit last time about how it's important because it's obviously different from dancers creating movement experiences for them that they wouldn't get otherwise. So can you tell us a little bit about the benefits of this? So some of the short term ones, I think we maybe said like strength, like, yeah, muscular strength in the short term, but then some longer term benefits. So maybe in their further dance development, the motor patterns they'll develop or things like that. Yeah, so there is one of the uh, sort of, I guess, rehab methodologies that I sort of have subscribed to, or as we would say here, drinking the Kool-Aid, depending on what you're talking about, <laughs> is um, this idea of like developmental patterns and developmental patterning. Um, so, which is interesting because once again, the, I feel like that idea has been like packaged in so many different ways um, in our in our current community, but you, when I first learned about this idea, it was through somatics and Bartinia fundamentals. And so I think there was, when I realized like, oh, this is kind of the same thing. So it just, I just gravitated towards that um, so much more. And I think that's also a great entryway for, for dancers to um, sort of like discover this different way of moving. Um, so physiologically speaking, um, if we're talking about if we're talking about benefits, um, I mean, you're really in, in the immediate, you're looking at periods of like growth and maturation and in periods of growth and maturation often also coincide with periods of like intense and increased training. And, you know, if, if I know people don't like the analogy of comparing the body to a car, but for the sake of illustrating a point, it's, you know, if you're, if you're driving a car on the freeway, you know, how do you maintain your speed and, and, and fix your car and, you know, soup up your car at the same time. And that's kind of the, the, the type of example I give where, you know, you're changing so quickly, so fast, but you have to maintain. And how do you, how do you do these things? So in the context of, um, maintaining like coordination, proprioception, balance as things get longer or things feel differently in the body, how can you provide sort of this good stress to them so they can, they can have the input to understand the, um, uh, the, the input to understand and adapt as they grow. Um, I think the other part of it too is in, in talking about growth and maturation, it, it provides a space for them to explore that. And it provides a space for conversation too. And it provides a space for them to recognize what their individual capabilities and capacities are and to understand that like, yes, you know, everybody I see we're always like comparing and stuff like that, but it does really change people's perspectives on themselves when you're able to offer them information like, hey, this person's growing faster than you or you're going faster than everybody else. Therefore, it's, you know, what you're feeling here, this discombobulation, this like uncoordinated sensibility of self currently is completely normal, right? So don't worry about it. We are here. There are ways that we can talk about this. There are ways that we can facilitate this um, back into your dance. So you don't have to feel like, oh my God, I all of a sudden I, I can't turn or I, I can't jump as well as I used to. Why? And um, that, you know, feeds into the whole uh, psychosocial emotional aspect of it. Um, and then in terms of, you know, long-term, we're also looking at things like bone density. I know with um, females, osteoporosis, osteopenia, which is a um, loss of bone density is often something that happens later in life, but the best time to sort of build that capacity and build that, um, the, the capability of your body to build bone density is in adolescent years. So I think there's a lot of fear, obviously, that goes into this idea of weight training and stunted growth and um, 
uh, adverse health effects, but like really, if they're if they're being coached and loaded and educated in the right way, it's absolutely beneficial. Yeah, definitely. And again, about being able to give them that understanding and the knowledge themselves, I think is something that a lot of dancers would really value. And um, something yeah. I would love to hear more about, and I think it's when I first reached out to you for the podcast, is when you posted this video of a warm up game that you had for your students. So basically, <laughs> the moral, and then I tried it with mine, and they literally loved it. So the moral basically is that you have found these really, really fun ways to incorporate SNC for young dancers in ways that you can do in a dance class in the studio. And it increases their engagement because it's not, like you said earlier, doing the same exercise over and over. It's something fun, it's something different. So can you tell us a little bit more about how you do this? So how do you increase this engagement for your dancers? So drawing on the research from kind of youth strength and conditioning, how do you make this fun and dance? Yeah, relevant to dance. Um. I have to give a lot of credit to the youth strength and conditioning community for spawning ideas like this, because I think that is a really big conversation, at least from from the from the areas and the people that I'm pulling from. I think that's a lot. Uh, there's a big conversation there where, you know, kids are not small adults uh, mentally, physically, physiologically. And I think I think sometimes with how good these kids are nowadays we forget that you know um and so i think with integrating fun and games or it, with you you sort of change it up a little bit for them it isn't that you know there are once again there are the times that we have to do the boring exercises just for you know the sake of keeping up with things but then there's the other part of it where it's like well okay how do we apply these um these concepts into something that it's a little bit more fun it's almost like you don't have to um you know if and it's the same for adults too it's like when you're in the moment you're not really thinking about like oh how difficult this is you're focused on something external and i think um besides youth snc i think a what really spawned this to was when I was in school, I had to, I was doing a pediatric rotation. So I was working with much younger kids. Um, we're talking like a year and a half, two years old. And so you basically have to create an environment for them where they are going to work on the things that they need to work on without actually realizing they're working on it. So if, for example, a young child is having difficulty, say, weight bearing on his right side, then, all right, I'm going to set up a low table and I'm going to just put the toy to the right side. And then I'm just going to, you know, slowly facilitate them. So they have to keep using their right leg to weight bear and transfer. Um, or maybe they have like difficulty reaching with their left arm. And so you take one of those like sticky toys and stick it on the wall in a certain direction. And then they have to like, oh, I'm just going to reach this way. But they're not thinking to themselves like, oh, I have to repeat this. They're just going for it. So um, I think being able to at the at the root at the root of it, it's how do you create an environment and how do you not necessarily set restrictions, but maybe like parameters to say like, okay, we're going to work on this. So um, the game that you had mentioned was, I mean, it's essentially foosball, human foosball, which is the the game where it's like the table and then you have the sticks that looks like a, a like a shish kebab, and then you can twist the uh twist the rods and so the the little uh people attached to it will like kick the ball yes so um so that was like the general framework but then we just chose like a, a static bear position just because uh developmental sequencing wise it's just that, that all force position is um pretty crucial just to get some upper extremity weight bearing understanding relationship of arms and legs but in that moment they're not thinking about that at that moment they're thinking about how do i get this ball over there, you know, strategically thinking. So it <clears throat> at least provides like an external cue for them, external, um, yeah, an external cue for them, external goal. So they're not necessarily always just like, okay, like what am I doing? And am I doing this right or wrong? You know, um, and then it also provides an opportunity for them to kind of like think about what we've been doing. So we might, I might say something like, well, okay, so what other position can we use? And there was one group that decided they wanted to hold a low lunge the whole time. And so that was much more challenging for them. But I mean, and they got a kick out of it. I think, you know, you can still work on things physically, but I think 
social and socially and emotionally it's a way for them to engage with each other in a space um, in a way that they don't usually engage with each other um, and it, especially in a a ballet sort of environment where things are very structured it's kind of nice to take down that structure a little bit and let them have a little bit of fun I think um, and I think once again like fun is the key word and fun I think most of the time we might just stereotypically associate it with like goofing off or, you know, not being serious and things like that. But there are things involved in fun um, where we can really look at, you know, how are they engaging with each other? Um, how do they, how do these kids feel seen and heard? Um, how do they feel um, engaging even with myself? Because, you know, I'm, I'm, coming into this environment and there's a part of me that also um, where I question, you know, they are so used to the structure where it's everybody listens to the person in the front of the class, which is traditionally what dance class is. But what does it mean when I'm just there to facilitate and you can explore your possibilities? And it, it's that, it's that fine, balance in between that I'm continuing to try and find uh, with with my kids and that changes day to day week to week so um, it challenges me to read the room and it challenges me to sort of as as uh, cliche as it sounds meet them where they're at right mm. um, yeah absolutely yeah. No, I'm like yes 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 everything you've said I love it like <laughs> I think yeah and it's so good as well to challenge yeah the teacher to be able to come up with these things as well um and yeah so much fun like when we did it we just laughed and laughed and laughed and then they mm -hmm. had like one of the best lessons they've had in ages so I think it just adds good so much, awesome so much to it so I'm gonna push you a little bit Rob so I always get people always push me they're like oh can you give us more specific examples um so I'm just gonna pass that one on to you I don't know if you've got any other examples of should we take maybe like warm-up games of ways that you can incorporate kind of basic fundamentals of SNC into these warm-up games for a dance teacher at the start of a session to kind of start to introduce these principles? Um, I generally will, well, so the game that we were playing, that was like for the whole session. We just, we just, I just let them like go with it. Um, but other ways, usually it's, uh, it's always really interesting to, to see where dancers are um, in terms of, you know, kind of like where they are in their, in their movement experience. And so I try to give everything that I try to give things that like people can do. And sometimes it's things that are a little bit more challenging for some than others. So, and once again, it's like, you have a whole class of 20 people, but you have some people that are like, well, I also enjoy we're in California. So I also enjoy snowboarding. I also enjoy surfing. I enjoy like skateboarding and skating. And, and of course you have the, the kids that like just do, um, um, just do dance or you have some other kids that come from like gymnastics background. And so you're trying to take stock of all of those things. And like, how do I sort of like even, even the playing field a little bit, even though it's kind of hard. So, um, I think it's uh, with games, it's like you can explore like dynamics a little bit. So some things we might even do like relays. So they'll have to do a certain exercise within like a certain period of time, you put them in teams. And so there's a bit of that like team effort thing going on. Um, sometimes we'll do things that maybe do a little bit more like hand-eye coordination because that's not like something they get. And so, you know, if I were to like throw a ball and like have you bounce and you have to side shuffle side to side, um, I'm just going to keep throwing them and like how many can you catch and how many can you, um, how many can you save and how many do you miss things like that and kind of like finding like a nice sort of like friendly competition going um, right? as if this environment isn't competitive enough right. <laughs> and yeah, and that's another challenge too it's like you know how do you how do you find these. How do you find these games that are going to like facilitate something, but they're not going to, you know, get so invested that they start getting frustrated and then you're like, oh no, that's another thing I need to talk about. So, um, yeah, the, then the other thing too, with, with 
sort of creating that fun environment is sometimes you just let them create their own sort of like obstacle course. You tell them like, hey, we'd love, uh, you know, we've been working on this for the last X amount of time. Um, I want you guys to create what you want. And they get super elaborate. And I'm not going to lie, sometimes there are things where I get ideas from from them too you know uh this was pretty early on but one of there was one session where they they pulled out the um they pulled out the ballet bar and then we're like oh we can do we can do squats and like squat under the squat under the ballet bar and like go this way and and each time we come up through we have to like hold a different position on a single leg or something and i'm like yeah Go right ahead, you know. Let like letting letting them explore, um, once again their capabilities, their possibilities, but also to like f- sort of like flex that creative creative side, um, in 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 this space. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Robert. And people can also check out there's heaps on your Instagram. It's such a great resource. So mm-hmm. I'll link that in the show notes. But that's so helpful. Thank you so much. The kind of last yeah last area I really want to look at today is from more of like a buy-in business perspective. So how do we, obviously you've brought this research and things into a dance environment. How, what would your advice be on how we can frame dance science as something that people feel like they want to engage with? That is a huge question, but how do we present and yeah, present it as an opportunity for them? I think it's gonna depend on who you're talking to. Um, obviously we, in the most immediate, we're we're dealing with the young dancers. And so to me, the most important thing is that they, one, they have fun and two, they, they feel good about what they're doing. Um, and I know once again, feeling is like very subjective, but at the same time, if you're looking at adherence and you're looking at, um, you know, why do we keep doing the things that we do? It's because we feel good doing it. That's like ultimately what it is. I I think with, and I know this for myself because like there are things that I don't want to do, I don't do it, you know. And we're here uh, in the new year with like resolutions, and then there's a lot of conversations about like resolutions and what are they actually really. But ultimately, it's like it's like what's the one thing that you you enjoy doing. So I think with the kids, it's yeah, you can tell them about the science, you can tell them about like this is the way we train, and you can offer them a different movement experience, but everyone's going to find something a little different. I do have kids that really enjoy structure. And so I'm going to be like, all right, cool. That's pretty straightforward for us. Then we are going to, you know, increase the load like this every week. And then you can see your improvements there. Fantastic. And then there are kids that are just like, I, they, they, their kinesthetic experience, like they need like different types of movement. And so the challenge then for me is like, how do I, how do I create something for you that is still going to work on the same things, but it's still a little different for you where you don't lose interest. Right. Um, For parents, I think the, the support side, knowing that, knowing that there is a resource for them um, that is not just like a deviation from the path, like I'm dancing, 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 and like, Oh, I'm injured. Okay. I need to do this. And then like, okay, I'm done. Let's go back to dancing, dancing, but rather it's that, that, adjunct adjacent support throughout. I know that's not typical of um, physical therapy necessarily here with the way things are mostly structured um, healthcare wise, but I think that more people are exploring what those types of frameworks look like, um, myself included. And I think really being able to explain things within the context of growth and um, growth and maturation and, you know, what that does for their relationship in their communities um, is, is huge for parents. Cause sometimes they were like, Oh, like my kid's not growing, you know, like what's happening here. And even then you're just like, well, that's, it's okay. That's normal. You know, there are no red flags that are coming my end, but if there's anything that we can do, maybe I can talk to you, your, uh, your family doctor or something. If, if something does come up, if I'm noticing anything, Um, so I think with, with parents too, they really appreciate that sort of comprehensive view where it's not just about the physical therapy and back, but there's almost, you're almost kind of just keeping like a, like a distant watchful eye and, and they appreciate that support when you can tell parents something about their 
children that they might not notice in the context of class, that's huge, you know, and it's not just about what they're doing. Um, it's not just about like, oh, I see that they're getting stronger or I see that they're performing better, but it's just saying like, hey, I noticed that so-and-so was really like into class today. And I, I, you know, it might be a situation where I don't see that often, but it was nice to see that change in personality. And they, you, you begin to notice them as humans and they're the, the parents also, hopefully they see that you, you see them and that you hear them and that their kids feel the same way. They feel supported. They feel encouraged in class. Um, now, when we talk about our specific community here in the U.S. with um, with talking to, for example, like studio owners, um, like ultimately they're running a business, and so how do how do we as people who want to instill change and um, give information and and create a better environment, you know, how do we how do we meet them where they're at? So it's. And I think information is is important, yes, but ultimately it's not information that mostly changes our minds on a, like a psychological level. It's or on a on a on a mental level. It's it's really that sort of emotional side too. Um, but I think in the context of dance studios, the way things are set up here, you kind of have to talk to them, or at least like open the conversation about recognizing their business needs and their bottom lines. Um, how does this information, how would it help your business? And I know I'm kind of like venturing into this whole idea of, of you know, we exist in a capitalistic society, therefore we have to talk about these things, but it's true. Um, if, if I'm talking to a studio owner, I can give them all the information about, um, I can give them all the information about like, like injuries will do this and you need that and you shouldn't do this. But do we have the conversations about, you know, if you have to put an SNC class in somewhere or some kind of like healthcare support, what do you have to take out? And if you have to take out something, then you're affecting somebody else's class. And if you're affecting somebody else's class, you're affecting their bottom line. Um, so what does that conversation look like? Uh, and that is something I am continuing to explore uh, myself. But I think um, I, th I think that being aware of that conversation has allowed me to be in contact with some people more consistently because they know that I'm not just there to sort of like talk down on them. So you need to do this. You need to do that. Kids are doing too much. Do a little less. Do a little more of this. But you're saying, okay, where are you at? as a business owner, you've run your business, um, you've run your studio in this context for you know, however many years. This has worked for you, this has worked for your community, this has um, worked for you in the context of the larger competitive dance uh, scene and experience. And how, how, do I, how do we sort of like collaborate to, to create something new? Obviously it's not gonna happen overnight, but just letting them know that you're even thinking about that, I think is huge. It just opens up doors for a lot of conversations. Yeah, definitely. And obviously you've acknowledged the difficulties there, but I think at the start of what you're saying, especially you've made that kind of integration sounds so natural. And I think it's made me think that maybe it can be. So with a bit of work on our part, like on our end, I think it can be, yeah, it can be a really natural kind of integration incorporating this research and yeah, like you said, like a level kind of way. Um, and I appreciate it's not that easy everywhere, but yeah, it's made me think that it can be done in a pretty a pretty natural way. And I'm definitely going to think about yeah. that. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you so much for your time, Rob. Like personally for me, this has been such like a, I don't know, I guess fulfilling conversation. Um, it's something I really thank love. Thank you. Yeah, hearing you talk so passionately about something I love is, yeah, it's really cool. And that's why I love doing it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. Think, yeah, there's so much I can work on as well. I don't know if you've got anything else you want to mention or discuss or takeaway message. Um, Just... Thank you for the resource you put out, because I think a lot of what I've been doing is a synthesis of a lot of the research that are done by people that you have talked to. Um, and and I think that there's I mean, it really is sort of a, a community effort, right? 
I think um, there was a period in my life where I was thinking about going more the research route, but I think at this point I'm looking at like, well, how do we just like sort of like apply, but apply within reason, you know, not just trying to like throw everything out there, but you're, you're, it's not looking at just like what needs to be done and what we need to do, but how, how we're doing it and how we're crafting it. So um, I, I think one thing I would encourage is to begin thinking about, you know, what is what are these strength and conditioning experiences that we're creating for young children within the dance dance context and within the dance environment in relationship to the changes that they're going through and the the dynamics that um, the social and emotional dynamics that they have to go through and how do we sort of ease that it's it's not just about getting it is about getting stronger it is about getting better but at the same time it's also about like well how do we dive a little deeper into our understanding of ourselves and how do we create those environments for them to safely um, and efficiently explore that. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much, Rob. It's been so great to chat today. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. See you later. Bye. Yeah. Thanks so much for listening. Tune in again next Monday. And in the meantime, follow at Side Dance Podcast on Instagram. It would also be so appreciated if you have a moment, if you could please rate and review on Apple to help the podcast grow. Bye.